having us. So uh, I'm going to kind of um, talk about web components uh, and how you can compose your applications. So I've sort of constructed this talk around um, composability and how web components can fit into that, that uh, way of thinking. So that's my face. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Ryan Seddon. Like John said, I work for Zendesk, um, and I blog a lot and do a few talks and whatnot. So web components is kind of an umbrella term for four sub-specifications. So that's kind of like the, the buzzword, like HTML5 sort of encompasses a lot of stuff. Web components has uh, four specs. So you've got uh, templates, custom elements, shadow DOM, uh, and HTML imports. And I'll just go through some code examples for each of them before we jump into composability. So first, we've got templates. Uh, templates has a new element called template. Um, it's kind of like how we use script tags and we do string templating, except this is an actual um, DOM node and we can query into it. Uh, so it's inert DOM, and I'll explain what that means in a second. Uh, the browser will pass it, but it won't render it to the screen until we take the contents of that and inject it somewhere. We can query into it, so that means I can uh, select the template uh, element, and then I can do query selector all, and I can affect and add and remove stuff from the template before I render it to the, um, to my, to the user's screen. Um, it won't load assets or run any script tags. So in that snippet I showed, we had an image and a script tag. That actually won't be downloaded. That script won't be executed until I take the contents of that and render that in the page. So we can see an example here. Um, essentially, I've got a button. Just reduce the size of that. Uh, we've, we've just got a button, and what it does is it grabs the contents of the template element. So if I switch over to HTML here, we can see here, if I just highlight it, you can see there we've got a template element. Inside that, we've got an image, and we've got a script tag that has an alert. And you'll notice that it actually won't run that script tag or download that image until I take the contents of it. Uh, and we can do that by uh, just using a normal query selector to grab the template element up the top here. And then there's a special property on the template uh, called content. And content's basically a document fragment of the contents of your template element. So that way I can do all the normal DOM operations. I can uh, go in and edit the source of the image and change it before I insert it. So maybe you want a dynamic image that loads based on user interaction. Um, and here I'm just cloning the node. So I could easily just append template content directly. Uh, in this case, I'm just cloning. Uh, so if you look at the output, <clears throat> when I click this button, it runs a script tag that was in there, and you'll notice it actually downloads the image too. Um, so that way we can have snippets of HTML that we can um, edit on the fly and not have to worry about any external assets uh, clogging up our performance. Uh, custom elements. So this is kind of the front-facing thing of web components that people will see. This is how you utilize a web component. This is like uh, how a developer will bring it into their application. Um, and it's a custom element, so we can define HTML elements that act like real ones, and we can add a whole bunch of behavior around how they work. Um, define new elements. They've got a bunch of lifecycle events, which I'll go into in a second. You can extend existing elements. So I can extend the div element, I can extend an image element. Uh, if it makes sense, uh, it would be, it's a good idea to build on top of what's already there. And we'll, I'll have an example of that soon. Uh, and it's a good way of extracting away, uh, abstracting away complexity. So behind that simple element, there's a whole bunch of things going on that me, as a consumer of it, I don't have to worry about. I just insert it and I follow the instructions of how it works. And then behind the scenes, Web Components is hooking up all these things for me. Um, and it must have a hyphen in the name. So you can't have single name components. Uh, that's so it doesn't clash with existing elements. Um, there's also, you can't use the word font face as well as a, as a custom element. It says in the spec. Uh, but you can use any other name you want. And you don't have to uh, proceed it with an X. You can have any sort of name uh, preceding your component. So to register that, we've got an imperative API. So document has a new method called register element on it. We pass that a string of our uh, element name. <coughs> and then uh, one more important thing you need to do is set a prototype to it. So the recommendation is to set the prototype of the HTML element prototype. So it inherits all the, the, um, the element properties of an existing element. Uh, you bring that into it. And then now you can just use Xreverse on your page. 
And so if we go back to the lifecycle events, we've got create the callback. So these methods are defined on the prototype that we just talked about. And these will get fired. So creator gets fired when I do document.create element or when I uh, have it in the page. Created element will always be the first uh, callback that is fired in the lifecycle of our custom elements. Attached callback will fire after create a callback, so when we actually insert it into the DOM. So if, if I just have it in my HTML document, it will call create a callback and then it'll call it attached. But if I construct it in my JavaScript and I do create element, that will be created callback will be called then, and then when I append it to my body, then attached callback will be, uh, will be called. Uh, we have detached callback, so that's the opposite of inserting the DOM when I remove it. Maybe I want to do some cleanup. Maybe I have some set timeouts or set intervals to do with my custom element, and I need to clean it up so there's not any um, code still running when the person removes it. And then uh, attribute change callback. So if I have any attributes on my custom element and that changes, I can get a callback and find out what's changed and then react to that. Um, there's also a new um, CSS pseudo class called unresolved. So if a component, uh, if a custom element takes a while uh, to render, maybe it's doing a lot of network calls to get some information, um, it'll kind of flash and then, and then it'll bootstrap itself up and have like the different styles and whatnot. So you can have the unresolved. So one of the strategies uh, that you can do is just set the opacity and then once the element's actually resolved, so when create a callback gets called, uh, you can then transition that in um, so it looks a bit nicer, so you don't get that flash of unstyled content. So if we take a look at some code of a simple uh, element, we've got X reverse. So if we go to the HTML, we'll see here we've got this X reverse element uh, there, and we've just got some text in there. It's pretty simple. And then in our create a callback, we call this method called reverse. Uh, so on the, it's important to know that on the prototype, you can define any custom elements that your, uh, sorry, any custom uh, functions or methods that your element might use. So in our case, X reverse has a method that just reverses the text. Um, and then we register that element with the same syntax we talked about before. Oops. So you can see here, that's called create a callback, and it's actually reversed the string. And I've hooked up a button that will actually call the reverse method. So that can just reverse on the instance of that element. Uh, we can access it that way. So that's a pretty simple example. <coughs> Next we have Shadow DOM. So Shadow DOM is uh, pretty interesting. So I've got just a screenshot here of, of an existing element that we potentially use all the time. Uh, it's a video element. Uh, but behind that, there's a whole bunch of complex uh, things going on. So if you, when you have the, the video element, you have the controls at the bottom. You have like the timeline, the volume control, the play, uh, the pause buttons. And the way that the browser vendors have been doing it is they've extracted away in what's called the shadow DOM, and now it's been defined, uh, and we can actually inspect that. So if I show you a live example, you can see here that we've got a video element. If I look inside that, you'll see that it's just got the sources and a track element. Um, so this is what they're sort of defining as the light DOM. So the video has some uh, nodes inside it that we as a user can see that someone who queries into it can find the source. Um, but in Chrome DevTools, if we turn on this little option down here in settings, so you click on that cog up there, and we've got what's called show user agent shadow DOM. Now I close that now. Now you can see it's actually exposed this shadow root. And inside that, then we can dig into the internals of that element. Um, and we can dig in and style. And you can see there can be nested shadow, shadow DOM elements, so input type range. That's a pretty simple element that we use. That's actually got a shadow DOM behind it to build up that, that sliding mechanism. So shadow DOM offers a few uh, attributes to it. Uh, encapsulation, so stuff inside the shadow DOM won't be allowed to see what's outside of it, and vice versa, stuff that's uh, got an element that has a shadow DOM won't be able to reach into it. So you can have some hidden uh, complexity behind your, your simple element that a user will use. Uh, hidden subtree uh, just means it's a document fragment, that shadow root that's hidden behind. And another interesting thing is we can encapsulate styles. So we don't have to worry about uh, having inheritance or any overriding styles bleed into our custom element. 
we can have it encapsulated. So any, we can do really simple selectors. So if I, in my shadow DOM, add a H1, and I set H1 in my styles, that would only affect the shadow DOM. That wouldn't affect the outside um, document that's um, rendered our custom element. Uh, events are retargeted. So uh, if someone on, on the video element clicks the play button, and they're listening to events on the video element, um, what the shadow DOM will do is just do some trickery behind that will actually retarget um, what gets sent back to the event. So if you do event.target to access the element that was clicked on, it won't be that element in the shadow DOM because uh, to you it doesn't exist and it's not there. So it's actually the video element that received that event. And there, there's some uh, magic going on behind the scenes. You can kind of think of the shadow DOM as iframe without the baggage. Um, and I'll put a star there because iframes still have some advantages, um, which I won't get into, but if you want to find out, come, come chat to me later. But they're kind of a similar thing. They've both got encapsulation with styles. They both uh, sort of hide away this complexity uh, inside a simple element. Um, they've got pretty similar um, concepts. So if we look at a really simple example here, uh, I've just got a button. Um, we call a method called create shadow root. And that then defines a shadow DOM inside that element. And then I can call normal DOM operations. In my case, I can set in a HTML. And I insert a H1. Um, you'll notice it's got this content element. And this is uh, specific to shadow DOM only. So what that says is the existing light DOM, so inside the button, I want to preserve that and keep it inside my shadow DOM. Because if I insert a shadow DOM and I don't have that, it will just blow away the original content and won't uh, consider it. So we need that in there to preserve it to, to still show. So if you look at the HTML, all that button is is just a button with some text in there. But if we look at the output, you see it's actually got that H1 in there. And because we've got the content, it's preserved that simple button text uh, in the button. So shadow DOM elements, uh, there's, there's a couple of them. Uh, there's content, which we talked about. It allows you to preserve content. Content uh, can appear multiple times in the Shadow DOM, and you can pass a select attribute, which allows you to distribute certain bits to different spots in the Shadow DOM. So you can control where, like, the first section, for example, here, the nth child, so the first section was inside my, my um, custom element, where that will be rendered in the Shadow DOM. Uh, there's also the Shadow element. So the Shadow element allows you to distribute multiple shadow DOMs. So on an element, I can define two shadow DOMs. Um, but what happens is the last shadow DOM will be the one that's rendered, and it'll just throw away the other one. But if I want to preserve it, then I use that shadow element, and that preserves it, and I can place it where I want to. So you can start to build up multiple shadow DOMs um, in your components, so you can um, keep your, your bits and pieces like, abstracted away and, um, in smaller uh, modules. There's also a bunch of CSS selectors that are specific to the shadow DOM. So inside the shadow, I can't reach out. So I have no idea what the host is. I can't, there's no way to target it with normal CSS. So they've introduced this pseudo class called host. So host is just a, uh, a pointer to um, that X reverse element. If I was to have a shadow DOM inside the X reverse, I could then uh, target it and do some styles to it to affect it. You can also pass it a selector. So maybe, um, it needs to have a certain attribute to have a different style or a certain class, you can pass that through as well. You can also react to state. So I can pass through the hover pseudo class, and I can react to when they hover over the host element. Uh, that works for active and any of the other pseudo classes that we have. Um, host context is an interesting one. Uh, it allows you to do kind of theming. So say I had a custom element on my page, um, and then uh, I change the class on the body, I can react to that class change because uh, I, in a selector, I just say, you know, foo um, host context. I want to affect my element when the body has class foo on it. So you can do sort of theming around that too, based on the class that uh, the custom element lives inside. And then there's uh, shadow and a new type of selector that hasn't been seen in CSS before called deep. And that's kind of a, it looks kind of like a regular expression. Uh, syntax in JavaScript, if you've seen that. So shadow allows you to reach into one shadow DOM. So in my X reverse, I can reach in uh, into the first shadow DOM that's rendered. Or in the video element, I can reach in and see the player controls and affect uh, some styles in there so I can customize the video player. 
deep allows me to traverse any shadow DOM, so I can reach uh, throughout the whole um, layers inside that custom, uh, inside that element. And then there's content. So we talked about that distributed content. So inside the shadow DOM, our content isn't actually rendered inside the content. It's just, we're just telling the shadow DOM to, hey, um, you should place it here, but it's not really there. So with the styles, we need some way to be able to target that. Um, and we'll show an example of that if this is all a bit much at the moment. And then lastly, we've got imports. So imports is a mechanism that allows us to bring in that custom element. Um, so if I want to use Xreverse on my page, I need to import it into the page. And this is a kind of a nice distribution model. Uh, it's really simple. So you can bring in easy mechanisms to bring in components. Uh, that HTML file can have a whole bunch of resources. I can bring in JavaScript libraries. I can bring in images, you know, CSS, font files. It's all just in one package. Um, components can import more components. So you can have a dependency graph of all the different components. Maybe it's built up of several different smaller uh, components to build up this bigger one. Uh, they're asynchronous requests. And I put the star there because they're not really asynchronous requests because as soon as, you, as, soon as it hits the script tag, it's going to block uh, rendering of the page. And you can't register an element without writing the document.register element. So the strategy is to actually dynamically insert imports um, using JavaScript to not block rendering of your page. Uh, otherwise, it could, if you had like 30 custom components coming in, it would just hit the script, it would stop, and your page would sit there for a while while they're all processing. Uh, and they could be easily distributed through any package manager, so through Bower or NPM or Component or whatever you want to use. And they've just got a, uh, just a HTML file as the entry point. <coughs> so back to composability. So if we think about how we can use all these APIs, um, in web components. We should think about a component should do one thing well. Uh, it should be really small and concise. And this kind of really ties back to the Unix philosophy. Uh, if you haven't heard of it before, it's basically emphasized building short, simple, clear, modular, and extendable code, or components in our case, that can be easily maintained and repurposed by developers other than its creators. So it's really thinking about how you compose your application together. So we'll go through an example. Uh, so I for Zendesk. Um, this is a Zendesk agent view. So if you're a customer support agent, this is the view you would see when your customers come in with a, with a request or a complaint or something. Uh, and so I'm going to extract a pattern out of this um, view and how we can build in web components and how we can compose our application together and think about um, uh, composability in, in our applications. So I'm going to pull out this uh, comment section. This is a really common pattern that you'll see across you know, most websites. Um, and I'm going to steal the name from uh, object-oriented CSS, if you've heard of that. And they, they define this as like the media object, where I've got something on the left that can be an avatar, it could be like an icon. Uh, that can appear on the left or right or not at all, and it could be prece uh, preceded or followed by some content, um, something. So if we were to break that up into components, we would have our media object, we'd wrap around the whole thing. We'd have our avatar or icon. We'd have our media component body. Uh, we'd have the header, and then maybe, maybe we'd have some content too. Uh, if we were to define this in HTML, it could perhaps be named media object. Inside that, we would have our avatar uh, element. And now, because uh, we can take this a bit a step further, because we're, we're going to make the assumption that an avatar is always going to be an image, we can actually extend uh, existing elements that I talked about. And you can do that using the is attribute. So is says, this is my custom element, uh, and I want to extend this existing element with this extra functionality. So we can define it that way. So already we're thinking about composability. We're like, well, avatar is going to be used elsewhere. Like, it's not just tied to media object. Uh, and that way we can extract that out and use it throughout our application. Uh, then we've got a media object body. I've just shortened the name to MO just for um, readability sake. Inside that, we've got media object header, media object content. So you can use all of this, or you can, uh, the only required element inside that is probably the media object body. 
Otherwise, everything should cater for it. So if there's an image, it will cater to show it to the left or right. Uh, the content will fill out the rest of the space. I might just have a header in my immediate object. I might just have content. You, know, you, can, you can really compose it to, to your needs. <coughs> so if we go back to that UI, and we were to uh, look through our, our application and find that pattern, you can see we've got it in four spots. Uh, and if I was to break it down further, you could perhaps see that maybe that tab up there is an immediate object, and that's, that's an icon followed by just a header, but I need the content. Um, in red, I've highlighted where avatars appear, so in the immediate object, they appear. Also, you notice up the top uh, right here, there's also an avatar. And you can see now uh, we can start to compose our application in, in relatively simple components that we can build up to make our UI. So let's build our X avatar element. So we do the same thing, we register it. There's two different things we're doing here. Uh, on the prototype, we're setting the prototype of the element that we're extending. So that's the image element, so we do HTML image element prototype. And we also pass the second property called extends, and we just pass a string of the tag that we want to extend, which is image. So that informs our component that we're actually extending. We're not creating a whole new um, HTML element for them to use. And then uh, in this example, I'm using a service called avatars.io, which allows you to pull out avatars from different services, uh, from Twitter, from Gravatar, from uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera. So what I can do in the creator callback, I can uh, look for uh, some attributes on our custom element, and then I can construct a URL, and I can just set the source, because I know it's an image. And I just set the URL. So now if we were to look at that, our custom component, xAvatar, would look like that. We'd have data service equals Twitter, username is Ryan, and that would construct and request and set the source for me, um, and it's relatively simple. We could take this a step further. Uh, what about if someone changes the attribute of service or the username? Uh, we want to be able to react to that. So that's where we can hook into the attribute change callback. So we could um, you know, simplify our code by extracting out uh, building of the URL. We could extract it out into another method that both attribute change callback and create a callback would call. And then so whenever they change, uh, it will just flush out and create a new uh, source and request the right image. Uh, if you want more granular, uh, granularity uh, in, a, in attribute change callback, it passes through the attribute name on the element that changed, so then you can then do specific things just to that attribute. In my case, I just want to blow away the whole thing and I don't care about which one's changed. But if you need that control, you can get it. So back to the media object. So media object imports our X avatar component. So remember we talked about uh, components can import more components. Uh, and we need some baseline style, so we need to set up that style where if there's an avatar, it will sit to, in our case, to the left, and the content will expand to fill up the rest of the space that's got available. So we use link uh, to pull in our uh, avatar element using the HTML imports um, functionality. We register all those other elements we talked about, so media object, media body, uh, we've got the header and the content. Now, to encapsulate our styles, in the creator callback of our parent media object element, uh, we can create the shadow DOM on that. And basically, uh, I'm just going to inner HTML uh, some styles, which is uh, a string of uh, CSS. And then I want to preserve the existing content. So I want to keep around the avatar and the, and the body of our media object uh, element. Uh, so that styles var is just a string of this um, CSS. So uh, I've got my host element, which is our media object, so I can target that. I just want to make it a Flexbox container, because Flexbox is awesome. Makes it really easy to do this sort of stuff. Uh, and then I target um, using the content thing, so then the distributed content, because the avatar exists inside our what's called the light DOM, if you remember. Uh, I would just want to give it a, a default margin of 15 pixels to make it um, have a nice gap between the body and the content. And then body, I just want to say, hey, just fill up the rest of the space. So I set Flexbox to one. Now, you'll notice I didn't use any classes. I was using attribute and tag selectors. Um, you can kind of think of baseline styles when you're creating a component, like the user agent styles that you'll see in a, in a browser. So you don't want to create any unnecessary specificity issues for a person who wants to consume your component. You want to stick to like the lowest possible thing so they can override it if they need to. 
Uh, so it's easy for them to, to put a class on their avatar and be able to change the margin if they want to. We just have some defaults set up that are quite simple. Uh, yeah, so stick to element and attribute selectors and simple ones that, don't, um, that aren't hard to override for a user. Uh, if we have a recap on host, uh, host allows you to target the Shadow DOM host element. Content allows you to target that distributed content. So inside my Shadow DOM, I want to preserve the light content so I can then target it inside my encapsulated styles. So we look at an example here of our media object element. You can see um, the styles is just a style tag with some CSS wrapped in there. Um, we could potentially have a template element and have a style element in that to make it look a bit more nicer and a bit more manageable. But just for simplicity's sake, I've made it a string. And you can see here I'm just inserting it and preserving the content. So you can kind of see that Web Components API starts to get a little verbose. And I believe that's on purpose. Because if you've ever been to the website Extensible Web Manifesto, what they talk about is browser vendors creating low-level APIs for people to build stuff on top of. So they're, they're about getting the features out there for you to be able to build and extend on. Um, and that's where something like Polymer comes in. So you may have heard of Polymer. This is a project by Google. Essentially, it's a couple of things. Uh, they've got what's called the Platform.js. Uh, and that's a bunch of polyfills, so you can start using web components today. Uh, it'll, it'll have support for Shadow DOM, the custom elements, uh, and all the other features. Um, they also have a layer on top. So this is where like, libraries come on top and build up, build up these low-level APIs. They give a, a, a declarative syntax that allows you to not have to write any JavaScript to declare a custom element, makes the, the, the barrier to entry of creating these a lot easier. Uh, they offer data binding, dynamic templates, so we can do things like repeaters like we're used to with our frameworks. Uh, and a whole bunch more. So they've got a polyfill for object.observe. They've got web animations. They've got a whole uh, plethora of stuff in there. So if we were to redefine our media object element, you can see I don't have to use any JavaScript at all to define it. I can use the Polymer element, which allows us to define custom elements. I can pass the no script attribute to tell uh, Polymer that actually I don't need to do anything when the creator callback comes. I just want you to handle that for me. So that, that'll automatically register the element. That'll um, then take this template. So anything inside a template inside a Polymer element will be inserted into the Shadow DOM. I can then reference an external style sheet, and that'll handle inlining it into the custom element. So now we can have a more manageable component, and we can build up on top of that uh, using this layer on top. So we look at a demo of our media component. You can see here, this is running on uh, Polymer library. You can see, uh, if I inspect this here, you can see we've got our X avatar here, body. You can nest media, uh, media objects, because Flexbox will just handle that out for me. I can even not even have an avatar, and it'll handle it. It'll just expand to the rest of the content. If we also go in here, we can see how the attribute change callback works. If I update this to someone else, so that works. you'll see that the attribute change callback fired, and now it knows to, to reconstruct the, the source URL and pull it down. So we can hook into these life cycle events and create really simple but powerful um, elements. We can also see the shadow root here. So we can dig into our shadow root. You can see that it's preserved our content. It's injected our styles here. Um, you'll notice some weird stuff like polyfill next selector. Because of some of the restrictions with polyfilling um, in older browsers, they need these certain weird selectors to help it uh, figure out what you're trying to style and make it work in browsers. Because the Shadow DOM is really hard to properly um, polyfill. So I highly recommend you check out the, um, the, uh, the docs for Polymer. Uh, another thing uh, that's really using this thinking is Mozilla Brick. So Mozilla Brick is a bunch of UI components created to help you rapidly develop your application. So they're thinking about composability. They've got things like a, a, a head, header, you know, to create a scroll list. They're all custom elements that make it really easy for you to build up 
uh, an application. And this is really um, came about for them for Firefox OS, but because it's uh, open web technology, it'll work in other browsers too. Uh, but you can create an application really quickly um, for their operating system or for the web. And I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, so they had composability in mind. They're built on their underlying Xtag library. Um, Xtag and Polymer recently came together and decided to both contribute to the same set of polyfills. So they've got interoperability between them. Uh, and they, they sort of work on the same polyfills or the native uh, support in the browser. So how does this tie into frameworks? Uh, you can kind of think that Angular directives are kind of a similar fashion of where web components are going, and that's kind of early thinking around that. Ember components, uh, same thing around creating it. Even React.js is around uh, creating composable uh, applications and UI. Uh, and especially Angular and Ember are really thinking about how in the future they can swap out these directives and components um, code and just use a native web components API uh, in the browser. So really, Angular and Ember become layer on top of, um, of web components, and you wouldn't have to use something like Polymer because your framework would just do it. So it's looking like sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows at the moment. It's all, it's all great. You'd be incorrect. Uh, web components have some issues that, need, that we need to think about and overcome, I think. Uh, so conflicts and relationships. Uh, so you can define a constructor method for your custom element. So I can say new X reverse, and that'll create my element. But what that's promoting is global pollution. So if someone else comes along and defines the same thing, uh, we could get some pollution, because it's a global variable, and we all know with JavaScript you shouldn't should uh, avoid doing global, especially if you're going to be embedding on sites, third-party sites that you don't control. Um, namespacing to avoid conflicts. Uh, so if I define X reverse, and then someone else has another component that defines X reverse, that's just going to overwrite mine. Um, there's no way for me to protect my element and say, hey, this is, this is a different element to their X reverse. Um, I can't create element relationships. So think like the options I select. I can't say in my media object element, that my media body can only exist inside the media object. There's no way of doing that. Uh, I could probably set up some complex JavaScript to handle and throw some errors or just not render the element, um, but there's no easy way for me to do it. One of the ways is XML namespacing, a bit like our good friend Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber, makes me dry rich looking at that. Uh, I don't want to be doing that, but that's, that's like a stopgap to be able to namespace our custom elements and protect them, but that's hideous. Uh, another issue is dependency management. Um, how can I get components to use, uh, that use the same library? So if a component pulls in jQuery, how can I get another component to share it, not to re-download another resource? So they've packaged it up. How can I get these, these uh, dependencies to be shared across all components uh, in a nice way? Um, so what about a component who's using two different versions? How does that work? Do they download both versions? Can they share? Can, do you get conflicts? Um, could potentially be solved through a CDN usage, but that's kind of a half-assed measure. There kind of needs, needs to be a way for us to be able to share libraries somehow, or not not have people download you know 36 different jQuery versions because they're using 30, 36 different elements. Um, what about accessibility, performance, and security? Um, how do I know the element I'm using is accessible? Like, if someone needs a screen reader, are they going to be able to use my application? Does it degrade the performance of my my website or my web app? Uh, does it introduce any security issues? Does it open up cross-site scripting or some other weird bug? Um, so as a consumer, as a developer using a custom element, how do I know these are considered? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, as a developer, how can I make sure I really think about these things and where can I find resources to be able to build components correctly? And this is an initiative by the Polymer team, and it's called webcomponents.org. Uh, if you go to that URL, it's actually broken at the moment. Um, it's, but if you go to GitHub, uh, you can, uh, at GitHub slash webcomponents, you'll see the, um, the repository there if you want to check it out. But basically, what they are about uh, is um, to answer all those questions. They're uh, thought leaders in um, the web components community about how you should be properly thinking about accessibility, performance, uh, security. Uh, they want to have like a peer review thing. So if you uh, 
upload a component for use, um, they have a rating system and a, like a review system to make sure that if I want to get like a, a slider element, that I know I'm using the best one uh, for my use case, uh, and they've really thought about all those things. Uh, they're also going to have articles around um, around how to do these as a developer of a component. So how can I make my component accessible, etc. Um, yeah, and that's just, it's like a little thing that they're pioneers of the community, members of web components, um, and they just want to document best practice and have some sort of peer review and information around building it. Kind of thing is the go-to place for web components. Um, if you're building one, I'm sure you'll be visiting that website. So a couple of takeaways. Um, we talked about web components really lend themselves to composability. So that means breaking down your application into smaller subset of, web, of components and then be able to compose that together, kind of like a puzzle piece. You're picking and choosing the pieces you need. Uh, Polymer and XTag allow you to build today. So uh, IE 10 up and every other browser, their polyfills work and you can start building today. Uh, the spec is rapidly changing, so be careful when you build. Uh, last year I gave a talk about Shadow DOM, uh, all the CSS selectors have since changed, um, but Polymer is really keeping up with that. Um, Chrome and Firefox are both adding native support, so they've got a, uh, in their nightly builds, they, they both have support for Shadow DOM I believe, custom elements and templates, um, they'll soon make their way down into the stable release browsers that normal people will be using. Uh, and your favorite framework will probably be a layer on top in the future. So like Angular directives in the future may be using the Web Components API. So you, you build the same way you do today and you don't have to worry about it because these frameworks are handling uh, doing that for you. So you hook into the, the native APIs. Um, so go forth and compose. Thank you.